All right. Um, today we're going to talk about overfitting and evaluation. Uh, this will likely take us two lectures, uh, but we'll start anyway. Um, so what we'll be talking about is we've already covered a couple of basic um, uh, classification algorithms. We talked about naive Bayes two lectures back, and we talked about decision trees uh, in the last lecture. And we talked about how uh, these algorithms can... Uh, how well they will do on your training data if you allow them to do, right? So we had an example of naive Bayes misclassifying a training example, and we also talked about how decision trees will never do that if you grow the full tree, because they will always perfectly split uh, your data. So today we're going to talk about why perfectly splitting the data might not be such a good idea. Um, uh, and, and basically what, what you care about uh, when, when you're building a classifier. So uh, training data, when we were talking about the data up until this point, we really meant the training data. So training data, these are examples that somebody gives us to build our predictor, right? And we talked about our examples are always in terms of pairs, x and y. x is the data, so x could be a bitmap or x could be an email. Uh, and y is the class that we're trying to predict. Uh, so y could be spam versus non-spam, or y could be, is it digit 0, or is it digit 3, or is it digit 9? Um, <coughs> so that's our training data. Now what we really want uh, is, once we build the classifier, we're going to use it for something, right? And what we're going to use it for is, uh, we'll use it for classifying data that it's never seen before. Uh, we're going to talk about future data. So that's the data that's going to come in this form. It's going to have the xi, but we won't know the right label for it. Kind of obvious, right? If we did, we wouldn't have to classify it. There's no point. Um, so think of it as emails that will come tomorrow. Um, always tomorrow. Um, and what you want to do when you build a classifier is you want to build a classifier that will work well on future data, because that's the data that matters. And at some point, at some level, how well you do on the training data isn't really all that important, right? So, because you, you will never really need to classify that training data. So, if you make mistakes on the training data, that's not terribly bad, as long as you do well on the future data, right? So, classifying training, training data perfectly is not useful. You already know the labels. Um, and it's easy to be perfect on the training data. Right? We talked about decision trees will always be perfect on the training data. And we'll talk about lots of other algorithms that will always be perfect on the training data, but not necessarily on the data that comes tomorrow. Um, and the reason there is a distinction is, so the reason that they're able to do perfectly on the training data is they will fit the types of patterns in the data that... Uh, that are not very useful, that don't generalize. Right? That's where the term generalization comes from. So your data has useful patterns in it, patterns that are useful pr for predicting if an email is spam or non-spam. It also has noise, so uh, features that are not indicative of whether the email is going to be spam or non-spam. And if you let the classifier try to predict things perfectly, it will fit the useful features, the useful signals, uh, it, it will also fit the noise uh, to, uh, to be perfect on the training data. And that's something that you don't want, because this noise will not be the same in the future. And if you fit it on the training data too well, you'll actually do pretty badly uh, in the future. So um, more formally, these concepts, uh, this concept is known as overfitting. <coughs> Right. So what is overfitting? Basically, when you're building a predictor, you have a choice of algorithms that you can apply. Right? Predict predictor is just a function. Some functions are more flexible than others. They're more complex, more powerful. They can fit more types of data. Other functions are a little bit more rigid. Right? So <clears throat> overfitting happens when you pick a function that is too powerful too complicated and too flexible to predict what you're trying to predict. And it's flexible enough in the way that it fits the noise in the data in addition to the signal. And by noise, I mean things that seem useful in the training data, but they will not appear again 
when you go uh, and run your algorithm on the future data. But the algorithm is too flexible and it will fit both of those things. Right? So that's an informal definition. The formal definition is uh, a predictor f, it's a function, it overfits the data if the following two conditions are met. So, uh, no, sorry. Um, f overfits the data if we can find another predictor f prime that satisfies the following two conditions. So f prime makes more mistakes on the training data. So it's actually worse on the data that we have today. It does, it, its accuracy is not as high as f. But on the data that comes tomorrow, f prime is going to do better than f. Right? So what that means, that is the definition that f has overfit the data. Because basically you could take something simpler, which is not as good today, but it will do better tomorrow. That's an indication that f, your classifier, has overfit. Um, on the opposite side of overfitting, there is underfitting. So underfitting is a problem that occurs when you pick a classifier that is too simple. Right? It's not complex enough, it's not flexible enough to capture the useful patterns in the data. Right? So it's, it's a little bit too rigid, and I'll give examples of what flexible and rigid look like. So um, now, uh, what it means formally is that there is another predictor f prime, which has better training error and better generalization error. So uh, f is underfitting if you can find another f prime, which would have higher accuracy on your training data and also higher accuracy tomorrow on the future data. So those are the definitions. It's useful to think of it in terms of um, sort of a graph like that. So um, uh, complicated models and simple models, it's not a black or white thing. There is a spectrum of flexibility in the algorithm. So if the x-axis is the spectrum where uh, the closer you are uh, to the right side, the more complex, the more flexible your models are, and the closer you are to the left side, the simpler and the more rigid models you have. So this is the complexity of your predictor, and this is the error that you are going to get. Right? So usually what happens is if you start with very simple models, you typically get high errors. Right? They don't do very well on your training data, so that's a solid line. They don't do very well on the data that's going to come tomorrow. Right? So as far as, as, far as simple, uh, simple classifiers, what is, what, what is the simplest classifier that you know at this moment? So the answer is just guessing, yes. So just guessing, you could guess randomly, right? What's a, just a little bit more sophisticated, but not really much more? It's the most frequent. The most frequent class, right? And that sometimes works really well. You remember our Nobel Prize example, right? You can always say no and be 99% accurate, right? So there are domains where really simple classifiers are going to do as well as anything else. Uh, but on other domains, these simple classifiers are not going to do well. They're, they're going to have a high error rate. Now, as you start making the model more complicated, by the way, taking the most frequent class, that's another, uh, another name for this, is using the prior, right? In the naive Bayes sense, it's like taking the prior and throwing away everything else, right? So if you take the prior and start adding things to it, if you start adding the class conditional model, you're making your model a little bit more complicated. And as you add complexity, as you add flexibility, in general, your performance is going to keep improving, your error is going to get lower and lower and lower. And then, at some point, an interesting thing will start happening. As you're making the model more and more complicated, as you're throwing more and more features into it and allowing it more flexibility using sort of nonlinear components in your model, the performance on the training data is going to keep getting better and better. So you'll get lower and lower and lower errors until eventually you will hit zero. If you're using something like decision tree, your training error will hit zero. You will have perfectly classified everything. But as you keep, if you keep measuring the error on the future data, if you could somehow, uh, you will notice that the future error will actually start rising at some point. And that is the overfitting that is happening uh, with your model. So, uh, and it will keep, the, the, the error on the future data will keep rising, it'll be higher and higher and higher. The more you fit to your training data overfit, the worse your performance tomorrow is going to be. So, um, and this happens for, for pretty much any algorithm that you, that you pick. The more complexity you introduce, the better you can fit the training data, and the worse it will behave um, on future data, right? So pictorially, I guess, 
um, this would be an example of an overfit f, and this would be an f prime, right? So f has very low error on the training data, and it has a relatively high error on, on the data that comes tomorrow, on future data. Uh, now, you could find f prime. f prime has a higher training error, so it's worse at training time, uh, but it has a lower future error. It's better than f uh, on the data that will come tomorrow. So that is the definition of um, overfitting. Now here are some examples, uh, and I'm showing them for two tasks. So this is classification, which we've covered, and regression, which we'll start talking about in a couple of lectures. <clears throat> so in regression, you're just trying to fit uh, lines to points in some high dimensional space. And in classification, you're just trying to separate one class from another. Right? So these are examples of underfitting. In classification, so you have two classes in some space, and you're using, may, and you're using a classifier that can only use linear decision boundaries. Now, now, in this case, the boundary between the two classes is not very linear, so no matter how you draw this line, you're not going to do particularly well. Right. <clears throat> uh, this would be an example of overfitting. So here you're using a classifier that's too powerful for its own good. It's too flexible. It is able to separate the training and testing data perfectly, but the cost of that is producing a very wiggly decision boundary. So uh, anything that's over here, any data points that come tomorrow that are in these regions, will probably be horribly misclassified. It would be just better to not draw a decision boundary that's so complicated. Right? So if you draw a decision boundary like that, yes, you would make some mistakes in your training data, but the data that comes tomorrow, likely you would do better than this. So this is overfit. Right? So that's for classification. You have the same examples for regression. So the, the green line represents the true function that you're trying to estimate, so you don't actually know that function. The, uh, the blue points are samples. These are your training examples. This is what you get to see at training time. Uh, and here we're using a rigid, inflexible model to fit these points, right? We're just fitting it with a, with a line, with a linear equation. If you, fit, if you fit it with a line, that's not particularly good, right? So you could actually do better. Uh, if you use a very high order polynomial, you will be able to fit the data points exactly. And by the way, notice that the data points aren't exactly on the green line. The reason for that is the green line is, that's the true form of the function, and we're assuming that the data has some noise, right? It moves a little bit from the true form. So now, if you use a very high order polynomial, you can actually fit a curve that will go through every one of the training points. But that usually results in a very wiggly line. So your red curve, which would be what your classifier has learned from these blue examples, is not very close to the green line which is the truth, right? So this is an example of overfitting. This classifier, uh, this regression function is too powerful, too flexible for its own good. You would be better off using something like that, right? Here you're matching the general form of this function, which, by the way, in general, of course, you never know, uh, but you're matching it quite closely. You have some error, but it's not too much. So odds are, when some points are generated from the same green line tomorrow, this will give a better accuracy or better error than this, right? Because, you know, if you get a point here, your prediction is going to be way over there, so you can have a huge um, error between the truth and what you're predicting. So these are just illustrations. <clears throat> now, um, so the, these, uh, these flexibility or the, or, the, or, or, or the complexity of the predictors, as I said, you can't think of it as black and white, right? It's not that you have flexible and inflexible predictors. Um, for each different data set, you actually need a slightly different level of flexibility. And what you want is you want to have a knob that allows you to sort of turn it left and right. And depending on how you set the knob, you will get algorithms that are either more flexible or more rigid. So, you know, if you turn, you know, if you turn the knob to the left, you'll start getting closer and closer to straight lines. And if you turn the knob to the right, you'll start getting wigglier and wigglier uh, regression lines or, or decision boundaries. That's, that's, that's what you really want. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the good news is that most algorithms we talk about in this course, they will uh, they will have knobs like that in various forms. They're not always obvious, but they're there. 
So <clears throat> uh, we talked about naive bays. Now, naive bays, it doesn't look like there are any knobs in there, but if you look at it in detail, uh, there are, right? So the number of attributes that we use, the number of uh, attributes that you generate from the, na from the data is a knob, right? Because you don't have to use all of the attributes. Sometimes, um, sometimes you have a way of generating attributes in a certain ordering. Some of them you believe are more useful, you generate them first, and then others, uh, maybe you should use them, maybe you shouldn't, right? The, f the fewer attributes you use, the more rigid the classifier becomes. The more attributes you add, the more flexible it will be, right? Um, other things, so in naive Bayes, we estimate things like variance, or remember the epsilon, that's our smoothing parameter when we do the Bernoulli model. We add it to avoid the zero counts. Right. So that is an example of a parameter. If you use small epsilons, you get models that, we, that are flexible, that will overfit the data easily. If you make epsilon large, you are making your classifier more and more rigid. Why? Because all the counts start looking more and more like each other. Right? So if epsilon is a billion, right, all the counts will look exactly the same for all the classes. So you'll get a very, very smooth and perhaps not very useful classifier. Uh, in fact, if you, if you make epsilon that large, your naive base will start behaving like just the prior. So like, like the most frequent class type classifier. Uh, you can also put limits on, um, on, the, on the variance, right? So if you don't put limits on the variance, then sometimes your naive Bayes can, uh, can, put very spike, can produce very spiky distributions. If you, uh, if you put clamps on how low the variance can go, or, yeah, on how low the variance can go, then you're introducing some rigidity into naive Bayes. Uh, for decision trees, it's a little bit more obvious, right? So we talked about the number of nodes of the tree. The more nodes you have, or the less pruning you do, the more flexible a decision tree will be. The more readily it will fit your training data perfectly and then collapse on the data that comes tomorrow. <clears throat> uh, you could also use the confidence parameter in the pruning. That's, that's just a flip side of using controlling the number of nodes directly. Um, and uh, we haven't talked about these yet, but these will make sense once we talk about these classifiers. So in general, uh, you want to have knobs like that, and you want to turn the knobs to optimize not the training error, not the error on the data that you have today, but the error on the data you have tomorrow. Which, uh, of course, is complicated because you don't have tomorrow's data today. Uh, so we can't estimate it, but uh, we, can't, we can't actually compute tomorrow's error, but we can estimate it to a, uh, to a good degree. <clears throat> 